believe may have been responsible for the partial collapse of a glacier that killed at least seven people. Officials have closed off part of this road as they are concerned that ice could break off from this glacier. The guards in Chamonix in France are suspending scheduled ascents of Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc, Mont Blanc is in the crosshairs of climate change. This mountain is where the sport and culture of mountaineering was born. The valley at its base has since grown into the world's largest alpine tourism industry, and the glaciers on its slopes are perhaps the best place on Earth to observe the effects of climate change on mountain landscapes. Looming precariously above the villages below, these massive rivers of ice provide water, regulate climate, and hold these peaks together. But as they melt, these mountains are becoming more dangerous for those climbing the peaks and living in the valleys below them. All right, before we dive in, I wanna give a quick thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. One of my goals for this year has been to be more proactive about mental health, to better understand my own stress, anxiety, creativity, and how I can manage them. Part of that has been speaking with a therapist and doing so using BetterHelp before they became a sponsor. Whether you have a clinical condition or you just wanna work on your relationships and mental health, therapy can be incredibly beneficial. It can also be a pain finding the right therapist, managing sessions and schedules, or even just finding a therapist at all if you live somewhere with limited options. And that's where BetterHelp comes in. They make therapy more affordable, more accessible, and just more convenient. You fill out a few questions and they'll match you with a professional therapist. You communicate with via video chat, phone call, even a text chat, and if your therapist isn't a good match, you can easily switch to someone new. It's all online, completely remote, and makes the whole process much smoother. If you want to sign up, it's really easy to get started. You can use the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com slash Aiden. Clicking that link supports this channel and gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. It's thanks to sponsors like BetterHelp that bigger videos like this one are possible. So thanks again to BetterHelp help, and I hope you enjoy this one. Let me put you back in. This all starts in a village called Chamonix, tucked away in a valley under Mont Blanc, the highest peak in the Alps. For centuries, this was a small community of farmers and herders. But in the 1700s, during the Enlightenment, Europe's artists and scientists became interested in these mountains, and they started traveling to this valley to climb the surrounding peaks and study them and create art depicting them. They would hire local guides, farmers and herders who were familiar with the mountains and could help navigate. These locals making some extra money on the side laid the very early framework for a tourism industry and became the first mountain guides, a culture and profession very much still alive in Chamonix today. It was a kind of key point in my life was like passing the qualification that really has enabled me to have a family and a house, you know, and, and live out, in, out here and have a proper life. Chamonix is one of the easiest places to live as a mountain guide. There's pretty much year-round work, there's really easy access to the mountains, and it really draws people from all over the world. But historically, it's, it's, um, it's the place to be as a guide. Among those visiting Chamonix was Horace Benedict de Saussure, a Swiss physicist and geologist who had come to study these mountains. He offered a reward to the first person to reach the summit of Mont Blanc. And in 1786, a doctor from Chamonix named Michel Gabriel Pacard reached the summit alongside a local hunter and guide named Jacques Balmat, an ascent widely regarded as the birth of the sport of mountaineering. By the 1800s, Chamonix had become the first hub for mountain tourism, with between two and 3,000 tourists visiting each year. But things really got chugging in the mid-1800s, when British mountaineers started flocking to the Alps to climb the highest peaks and hardest routes, once again relying on local guides to reach the summits. This period around the 1850s and 60s is often referred to as the Golden Age of Mountaineering, when most of the highest peaks in the Alps were first summited. Tourism in Chamonix continued to grow, the village eventually becoming an expansive resort attracting millions of visitors each year. But as this community grew and evolved, other changes were taking place in the mountains above. Take a look at this map of Chamonix from the 1890s, showing the range of the glaciers. Many of them extend right down to the valley floor, 
like the Argentier Glacier, which once reached right to the edge of town. Today, it's retreated far up into the mountains, sitting about a thousand meters above the valley below. The Bossens Glacier tells a similar story, once reaching the edge of town, but now sitting about 600 meters higher. One glacier really stands out, the Mer de Glace, or Sea of Ice, the largest glacier in France and the second largest in the Alps. In 1908, a railway was built leading to this overlook of the glacier. Old postcards from the station show a glacier living up to its name, a sea of ice hundreds of meters deep with crystal blue waves cascading past the viewpoint and far into the valley beyond. The same vantage point today tells a different story. We're taking a cable car down to get closer to the ice. When it first opened in 1988, this cable car stopped just a few meters short of the glacier. Today, a series of 500 stairs lead down to the edge. The stairs change as you work your way down, new ones being added every few years. Along the way, you pass these markers on the rock, noting where the ice used to be. The years becoming closer together, and the signs becoming farther apart. They're building a new cable car, which is kind of right over here. It's right next to the level of the ice cave, and it's going to be taking people up, up and down from there. And it just means that the access is a little bit easier moving forward as the ice is disappearing. Certainly, probably in, in our lifetimes, this ice is going to be completely gone, and they'll probably have gravel tracks and things, you know, for, for people to walk on to get up to the start of the ice. This hole here is actually where the ice cave that they've been digging, it's kind of, the ice has got super thin and then it's collapsed in. Now it's got a big hole in it and then rocks could fall in on people, so digging another one. Why dig an ice cave in the first place? You know, it's a tourist attraction. Yeah. The steep rock walls on either side of the valley give you an idea of where the glacier used to be. The newly exposed rock has slowly crumbled, covering the ice with a layer of rock and dust. Honestly, you might not even realize you're on a glacier until catching a glimpse of the blue ice underneath. As we made our way up the ice, things started to change. We found ourselves navigating the complex and ever-changing structure of a glacier, crossing streams of meltwater and peering into deep holes in the ice. After hours of hiking and climbing, we found ourselves in a place that just felt too good to be true. At the foot of the highest peaks in the Alps and overlooking their largest glaciers. It felt like a glimpse of what captivated people about this place centuries ago. And a reminder of why we can't help falling in love with these landscapes. Living and seeing glaciers every day, you, you know, I look out my window, I can see a glacier. Uh, it's, it makes you think about it. It makes you think about what's happening to them all the time. You know, every day you're looking at it and how it's changing. And even over 15 years, you can see a huge change. Um, so you feel part of it. You feel part of what's happening. You see it every day. What type of rock is this? <laughs> what type of rock is that? <laughs> this is granite. Let's get into this, specifically last July. When was it first evident that it was going to be like a different, like more cautious uh, climbing and mountaineering season? So I guess last summer was starting to be quite worrying for me at the end of the winter. Last year, the Alps had received less snowfall than usual. And in spring, strong winds blanketed the mountains with dust carried over from the Sahara Desert. And we were just kind of like, wow, we haven't had much snow and it's already super warm. 
and it kind of carried on like that. With a lack of snow to reflect the sun and a layer of dust to absorb it, the landscape started warming faster than usual. Once summer hit, a series of heat waves set record temperatures across the Alps. And by July, they were largely free of snow, which usually doesn't happen until September. The glaciers changed so much, you know, there was a lot more crevasses, there was a lot more bare ice, there was a lot more meltwater lakes on the glacier. It was crazy to see how much certain parts of the mountain had changed. The snows melted, temperatures are higher than ever, and the mountains start to fall apart. A heat wave may have been responsible for the partial collapse of a glacier that killed at least seven people. Rescue efforts have resumed, but hopes of finding survivors are fading. At the same time, temperatures here on Mont Blanc were abnormally high. Ice melted faster than expected, and dangerous rock falls became more frequent. So frequent that guides canceled trips to the summit, huts closed, and warnings were issued to climbers in the area. The most popular mountain in Europe was completely shut down. Hundreds of people go up there every day during the summer to try and climb it. And when they close the huts for several weeks, and don't let people up there, that's, that's quite a big deal. That prolonged heat in the mountains really made my job more difficult, but you just have to adapt and also kind of educate people to what we can do and what we can't do and why. If you tell them that the mountain could literally fall down, they're not so psyched to go and do it. Um, yeah, it was quite, a, it was quite an interesting summer to, to see. Yeah, it was, it was not great. This isn't the first time Mont Blanc has been closed due to melting ice. Summer closures are becoming more and more common due to climate change, specifically something called elevation-dependent climate change, where areas of different elevations warm at different rates. In most places, including here in the Alps, that means the high mountains are warming rapidly, about 25 to 50% faster than the global average. One of the best places to see this is right here in Chamonix on Mont Blanc, a name that translates to White Mountain, referring to the over 100 square kilometers of ice that cover the mountain. These glaciers are some of the best documented on Earth, and with thousands of people climbing and living below them, the impacts of their retreat are significant. Glaciers in the mountains are often a critical water supply for people living below them. They regulate temperature and climate, and in Switzerland, their meltwater is a source of renewable energy. Glacier conditions are a constant consideration for climbers and mountaineers who spend time traversing across them and climbing beneath them. Incredibly vulnerable positions to be if a section of ice breaks off. Ideally, you climb stuff when it's cold, have breakfast at one, two, three o'clock in the morning, something like that, and then you start climbing with a head torch and you get up as high as you can, as fast as you can. I'm trying more and more during the real hot part of the summer to be on more kind of uh, vegetated mountains or you know I try and go to places that I know are really solid. Seasons are definitely getting slightly shorter whereas you'd maybe spend more time in the summer like doing more kind of mountaineering routes or tours on the glacier that is kind of shrinking so things are shifting forward into colder times. But glaciers aren't the only thing melting here. Tall mountain peaks are held together by permafrost, a layer of rock and soil that stays frozen year-round and acts like a glue, keeping the rocks from breaking apart. As it starts to melt when it's really warm, you just get these huge rock falls happening. It's scary because you can actually be on what can feel like a relatively solid piece of rock and it could peel off. I nearly got my head taken off by a microwave-sized block once coming down from a peak. Luckily I saw it and I managed to dodge out of the way, but that was certainly a, a moment that I will live with of feeling very close to, to dying. So it's very unpredictable. Avalanches and rockfalls are the biggest dangers in the mountains, and as the climate warms, they're only becoming more frequent. But they aren't just a hazard for climbers and mountaineers. They can also be dangerous for people living in the valleys below. We talked about glacial collapses, but there are also glacial floods. That's exactly what happened to a town just down the valley called St. Gervais. Nowadays, it's a large ski resort, but in 1892, the entire town was destroyed by a flood from one of the glaciers above the valley. And it almost happened again. 
In 2009, researchers found 80,000 cubic meters of water inside the glacier, ready to cause another similar flood. As these glaciers melt, collapses like this will become increasingly frequent. And many towns here in the Alps are situated in deep valleys right underneath the glaciers. We're in a better position this year than we were last year, but I think also we're still a little bit recovering from last year in terms of how much snow we lost off the glacier. The Mont Blanc Massif is really renowned for its good quality rock. And also we've got the highest peak. You know, we have amazing huts, we have amazing mountains that have amazing roots up them. You know, it's very well known as, as the kind of alpine climbing capital of the world. I think generally people are concerned about the future of the mountains. There's still people climbing them, we're still doing things. Yes, things are getting slightly shorter. Yes, you're not able to do the same number of routes that you used to do. You know, I'm certain that it's gonna look very, very different in 20, 30 years. I mean, we're still gonna have these big mountains. They're still gonna be here, but there's just gonna be less snow and ice. You know, so there's gonna be more loose rock you know, maybe that that becomes more of the risk that we have to mitigate is finding a way up these things, avoiding loose rock, you know, rather than avoiding crevasses or steep snow. But I do think that, you know, alpine guiding and, and kind of working in the mountains is still going to be a thing. Um, it's just going to look different. I think that's the key is like adapting. I think you have to adapt to, to what you're given and, and that's what we're gonna have to do, you know. And as much as I'd love to see it stay like this or improve, um, you know, if it doesn't, then I'll adapt. <laughs>